This is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine. Plus, global business, finance, and tech news. The Bloomberg Business Week podcast with Carol Messer and Tim Stenebeck from Bloomberg Radio. All right. Nobody does it. I got to say, just listening to our Mike McKee, he's got to be the hardest working man in economics. He is. Cowboy hat and all. Love it. I I do too. (laughs) Um, But just interview after interview, really trying to get to the heart of what's going on in the economy and what it means for U.S. monetary policy. He has spoken with several members of the Fed uh, and Fed central banks, if you will, um, or Fed regional banks, I should say, in today alone. So let's get right to him because... Bloomberg News International Economics and Policy Correspondent Michael McKee, sans hat, what happened <laughs> what um, <is> it? <laughs> there at the Jackson Hole Economic Policy Symposium. Um, Mike, good to have you here. I am in awe. I usually am anyway, but man, you've just been having one conversation after another. But let's start with Jay Powell. What sounded very familiar to you? What sounded that like maybe it's some new news? I didn't think anything really sounded new. Uh, what he did was sort of restructure it, uh, the, what he has said before, in an effort to sort of give it a hawkish tilt. It's sort of a, un, uh, a, a message to the bond market, don't get carried away, we still have more work to do, and uh, we're going to do it. And if we needed to raise rates again, and if we needed to risk a recession, uh, we would do that. But right now, it doesn't look like that. Things look pretty good. Was there anything he didn't say or leave out that you think is notable? No, but what I did think was interesting was when he said that we don't know what the neutral rate is. And he said we are going to keep 2% as our target. That's not going to change. Those are two of the things that have been talked about on Wall Street, global Wall Street, really, as things that he might talk about or that the Fed might change. And he was at pains to basically say, I heard you and you're wrong. And uh, those were direct (laughs) messages to people who think that the Fed might be adjusting its policy. So no, 2% is it and we're going to get there. That's basically his point. That's basically his point, and they're just going to keep the pressure on. Now, what does that mean? Does it mean they have to raise rates again? They don't know, but he said they're prepared to if necessary. It could also just mean that they keep rates where they are for a very long time into 2024 in order to ensure they're getting back down to 2%. Mike, what I wonder is, at an event like this, where there is obviously Jay Powell, and he's one of the stars, if you will, for lack of a better word, you've got Christine Lagarde, another one. And and then, of course, you've got, you know, the Fed presidents that you've been speaking to and others. Um, What are the kind of conversations that they have that you are aware of? Like, what is it that they are trying to learn from one another in an environment like today? Well, there's a lot of discussion about the unusual situation we find ourselves in the global economy. Uh, The idea that uh, we are seeing inflation that went so high, so fast because of supply disruptions. Now those supply disruptions are starting to normalize, but we are still seeing elevated inflation and no impact on unemployment. Labor markets are strong everywhere. I've been talking to a lot of the European central bankers, and that's one of the first things they say is labor markets remain very tight. And that's not how it's supposed to work when uh, central banks raise interest rates that high. So there's a lot of talk about what's going on in labor markets and why we're seeing what we're seeing. There's a, a kind of a general feeling that the pandemic reset expectations for workers. Some of them retired more early than they otherwise would. Some don't have the social safety net to enable them to get back to work, which means there are openings out there still. And that gives them hope that we're going to still see strong labor markets, but we're going to see, uh, and that'll mean strong growth, but we're not going to see it be inflationary. There's been so much chatter, too, about the debate within the Federal Reserve about where do we go from here. Based on your conversations with Federal Reserve officials, how divergent do their opinions seem to you? 
Well, I have to say that after Powell's speech, nobody changed their minds. Uh, <laughs> we did speak with Patrick Harker, who thinks that things should be on hold, and Loretta Mester, who thinks that things should they should have to raise rates again. Uh, basically, it's a question of tactics. Uh, do you raise rates a little bit more, or do you just sit and wait and see what the impact or the lagged effects of what you've already done is? And that's what the debate is for them. But even those like Mester, who think that probably another rate increase is justified, she said she's willing to change her mind if the data come in and show that inflation is still going down. And they have these two inflation reports before we get to the next Fed meeting. Hey, Mike, it was hard to pick a, a soundbite from all the interviews, incredible interviews you're doing, but we did do just that. Uh, here's just a little snippet of Mike's conversation with Philadelphia Fed President Pat Harker, who definitely had a point of view when it comes to monetary policy. At this point, we really need to see inflation moving down. And we're seeing early signs of that, but I want to keep rates where they are right now, and then we'll decide later what we do. All right, so that's Pat Harker, obviously president of the Philadelphia Fed. So he wants to keep rates here. It, it's interesting. Matt, uh, Mike, rather, how do you think about last year, the conversations, the themes, the trends versus this year? It's kind of interesting because I've talked to a couple of central bankers who said the same thing. We're in a difficult situation for them because last year they could come here and say, we're going to raise rates, no question about it. Markets don't price in any kind of easing. We've got a long way to go with inflation. Now you've got this ambiguous situation. Do we have to raise rates more or do we just sit where we are and the economy is giving us mixed messages on that so there is a big change in tone and emphasis here from last year but there's also been a big change in the data inflation's come way down unemployment hasn't moved and growth as the chairman said is stronger than expected you mentioned you know how much inflation has come down in the past year what about in jackson hole are things expensive are they cheaper than last year what are you noticing I, they are more expensive than last year. Some, somebody noticed that uh, the, the, the Pioneer Grill, Tom Keene's favorite uh, stop <laughs> here, has uh, raised its prices somewhat. Uh, Jackson is also kind of a more expensive place. It's become a very much a tourist destination in the <laughs> summer. So you do see that impact. But I think you're seeing here what you have seen everywhere. Prices went up. Now the question is, do they keep going up or have they recouped costs and now they can keep things steady. I guess we'll just have to come back next year and find out. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Managers, are you listening? <laughs> and we do have, obviously, a batch of inflation coming up, as you know, with the PCE next week. We have CPI on the 13th. But what do you think is, is that enough, depending on what that data tells us, to make a divergent decision once we get that rate decision on September 20th? Well, if we get what we're expecting, it probably means the Fed pauses again, and those who think we need higher rates are probably willing to go along with that. They'll put their sights on November. We should see a slight rise in the CPI and the PCE because of base effects and energy prices going up. The interesting thing to look at is going to be the core PCE X housing, the J Powell indicator, which he talked about today as still being too high. So do we see further progress in that coming down or does that level out or does that actually go up that would be maybe a warning signal for november but i think uh, if we see very little change even if it's up a little bit uh, we're not going to see much happen in sep uh, the september meeting hey mike was it a little funky when uh in conclusion in jay powell's prepared remarks he said as is often the case we are navigating by the stars under cloudy skies um it just felt like a little woo woo to me uh mohammed el arian on bloomberg tv kind of brought you know brought that out but it was kind of pointing out there's a lot of things going on globally that are beyond our control yeah um this is one of those things like uh the grateful dead if you have been a fan for a long time you <laughs> like know jay powell yes that line that line came from his 2018 speech here at jackson hole his first speech here as chairman ah. when he talked about the various star measures r star and u star and he was making the point at that time that since we really don't have a way of knowing what those numbers are it's kind of hard to set your policy by an r 
star. And so yeah. he's referring back uh, to the same thing he said uh, some time ago, uh, six years ago now, I yeah. think. And uh, <laughs> it, it, for those of us who've been here for a long time, it was kind of funny. All right. Hey, also kind of funny. I'm going through my social media on Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it. You chatting with the Fed chair, hot and all. Did he like the hat? We have it up. <laughs> We're putting it up on everybody on YouTube and Bloomberg Originals. Did he like the hat? <laughs> He liked the hat, uh, and uh, I offered him the hat for his speech today because I told him people were worried that if I'm wearing the hat on TV, they're looking at the hat instead of listening to what I'm saying. And I said, that could work for you. <laughs> Everybody will talk about the hat Jay Powell was wearing, and they won't be worried about what you had to say. He declined. Well, listen, great stuff as always. You, man, have earned it this week in a big way. And for anybody who's missed any of Mike's conversations, uh, all you have to do is uh, head to Bloomberg Talks, our podcast feed, download it wherever you get your podcast. Michael McKee, you're a gem, hat, no hat. Uh, Bloomberg News International Economics and Policy Correspondent Michael McKee, safe travels, joining us from Jackson Hole, Wyoming. You are listening and watching Bloomberg Business Week on this Friday. Carol Master, along with Jess Metten, and for Tim Stanovic. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern. Listen on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. On the Bloomberg, just came across a story today about how J.P. Morgan Chase basically weighing in on the crypto world today, saying the recent sell-off in crypto markets is likely near an end, with long position liquidations, quote, largely behind us. This was a research report by J.P. Morgan Chase. And yet, they are making note that while regulatory and legal issues seem to be waning, at least for now, still to come, quote, a new round of legal uncertainty for crypto markets. And so, you know, more on JPM's call, you can find it on the Bloomberg, but it's been a very interesting, we know the carnage, right, that we saw certainly earlier in the year, certainly uh, over the last year, and a real rethink on crypto. And one of the things that many would argue and point to is that we've got to figure out the regulatory side of everything. And that's always been the big question mark about what's ahead and how it does impact particular companies that are in that industry, and especially investors on where do you go from here when you're trying to invest in something so volatile? Well, yeah, you want transparency. You want to <laughs> right. make sure you understand the rules. So let's get into a little bit more of the regulatory side of crypto. Back with us is Mike Belshi. Entrepreneur, scientist, one of the first 10 engineers on the Google Chrome team. So uh, really is a, a forward thinker, if you will, when it comes to our evolving tech space and just how tech is kind of invading everything we do. Uh, early on in the more developed crypto space as well, he's co-founder and CEO of BitGo. They provide security and operational support to global institution clients. So he's a good uh, worldwide perspective. Uh, joining us as we do every week at this time, our weekly look at crypto. He is on Zoom in San Francisco. Mike, hey, nice to have you uh, back with us. How are you? Doing great. Thank you, Carol. Thanks for having me back. Appreciate it. Always good to talk to you. Well, we appreciate it as well. Um, first of all, I just want to get an idea of, remind everybody what you do and kind of your vantage point. I always like to kind of set the stage for everybody. Uh, and I feel like those who are in it can s describe it best. And then just kind of the level of activity and demand that you're seeing for your services in today's environment and maybe how it compares to the peak of let's say Bitcoin, 68,000 back in November of 2021. How has the perspective changed? Sure, well, you introduced me as a technologist, which is true, that's my my 30 year background, uh, you know, all the way back to Netscape a long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, but these days, actually, technically, I guess I'm more of a banker. Um, so BitGo is a digital asset custodian, kind of the first of its kind that was built, I think seven or eight years ago. We actually run four different trust companies across the globe today. We've got in you know New York DFS, we've got South Dakota here in the US, we've got Switzerland, we've got uh, a Boffin regulated um, entity in Germany as well. So we run a lot of custody um, and it started with a high tech wallet platform. We pioneered how to do secure storage of digital, digital assets long ago, eliminating single points of failure. And the reality is you can't build a reliable banking system if you don't have a great foundation. So that's what we aimed out to do in the in the beginning. You know, we started out with technology, we moved into custody. This is where we take all the keys in a regulated, qualified custodian, bankruptcy remote way. And then these days we're actually moving on to the next level, which is really how do we build the market structure? And of course you hear about a lot of lawsuits going on in the industry from regulators uh, against certain players that are already in play. You hear new proposals about how to regulate or how to structure 
uh, the markets for crypto? Should it be under the CFTC or the SEC? Um, Bitco's trying to push on that too. Even despite some of the crypto regulatory concerns that are out there, you were still able to raise $100 million in Series C funding. How tough is it right now to try to raise funding? Well, I, I don't like to uh, sound like I'm bragging or anything, um, <laughs> but it, it's brutal out there um, mm. is probably mm. the right answer. So uh, you know, why it's, wasn't it's, it brutal for you? Well, I hope to say that, you know, Bitco's achieved a level of success and, and uh, excitement kind of on the go forward basis. So look, our existing products have been working well. There's been a big flight to safety, just given all the concerns of the last year. Um, you know, there are a lot of failures on other uh, uh, parties in the ecosystem. Uh, so people are looking for somebody that's doing it right. Bitco's always taken a tried and true approach. We operate custody as the core of what we do. Custody is a different element than trading. Um, you know, we tend to not have any issues like with what's going on with with other folks with with their entanglements with the SEC, because what we're doing is holding assets on behalf of clients. Um, and then on the go forward basis, you know, people are excited about the market structure we're building. We announced this thing called the Go Network, which is basically introducing the first time where you can start to have a settlement distinct from trading, distinct from custody, um, so that uh, you, can, you can start to have safe landing of assets, keep everything in cold storage, and yet still have access to full liquidity. Well, then let me go back to how I started, Mike. So what's what's the level of activity and demand? I get it. It's like the regular, you know, traditional financial system, right? You have your custodians um, that are out there for, for financial assets, if you will. And so I'm just curious, what's the level of activity and demand for your services, specifically in the crypto world, and how it compares to, I guess, I, I'm using November of 2021 as a peak because that's when Bitcoin was so high, and maybe that's just a random point. But I'm just curious what you've seen. Where are we? How would you kind of quantify it or describe it? Well, I mean, the markets are a little bit down, right? So as yeah. a financial institution, I mean, uh, you know, the market prices are down. So our assets under custody, you know, they were up. Uh, I think we we advertised up over $64 billion in AUC. I think it was at the end of 2021. Uh, our assets are down today because they're marked to a lower value against the U.S. dollar, but we haven't lost the coins. The coins are all still in custody. And so it's just a value there. decline, not the actual coin itself. Right. As soon as you know Americans start measuring their wealth in BTC instead of in USD, we'll all be on the same page. Talk to us about who your customers are, because I was surprised also to see Nike on that list. Uh, sure. I mean, we're we're a, a business to business and institutional player, so we don't hit retail a lot. There's some high net worth individuals, but you know, funds uh, use us, exchanges use us, payment processors use us. Um, and then when you mention Nike, you know, corporates are using us now. Nike in particular, uh, they happen to be integrating with the NFT and some of the DeFi space. So as soon, as soon as you start talking about digital assets, we're unlocking. Not just you know cryptocurrency, not just tokenized securities, not just stable coins, but actually there's this other world as well of you know non fungible tokens, which is basically digital property. Um, and if you think about how technology has emerged, like with protecting you know digital property rights over the last you know 25 years, there's been a lot of different approaches. But I think NFTs are actually the first true digital asset property. Um, that, that, that can be used. So anyway, Nike's big on that space, so we're helping them with a number of a number of efforts. Are more companies doing that? I, that's where I kind of get the blockchain and kind of digital world in terms of when you think about digital property and whether it's um, intellectual property or things that you really want to kind of have, uh, if you will, almost an address, you know, that goes with them constantly. And so there's no question. So are we seeing more companies like Nike tap into you specifically? There are, yes, there are a bunch of major brands that are all interested in figuring out how do they really show that uh, the assets that they create are, are, are bona fide and real. Um, so you see this from top designer brands. There's been a number of initiatives where they are looking to use NFTs as ways to say this is a, a, a true designer product as opposed to a knockoff. And then you've got you know loyalty programs that are being built. You've got gaming programs that are being built. So there's been a lot of growth in the NFT space. So for Bitco, you know, as a custodian and a wallet provider, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times these early industries, like the value of the things that they're trading are, are relatively small. But as they grow those businesses and they grow their demand, it grows a lot. And you know, what, is, what does a bank do? What does a custodian do? Well, we're here to make sure that you give us the assets and we're going to give them back to you when you want them. 
And as the value goes up, you use higher and higher levels of security to protect it. So Bitco is building a full stack every, everywhere from the bottom layer of pure technology security to the next layer of how do you do custody in a regulated safe way. And then above that, building liquidity sources, you know, having insurance backups and things like that. So Mike, when it comes to a regulatory environment, what is it that you are looking for? Is it a decision on spot Bitcoin ETF? Is it the Ripple decision? What is it for you that you think is significant? Well, what matters to all of us actually is a safe understanding of the risks that are be ta being taken by the intermediaries, the banks, you know, uh, that are in, in process, um, as well as basically the, the, the fundamental right that we always have access to money. And blockchain technology provides transparency uh, to everything that's going on. You can't hide, you can't, you can't be asking others to sell while, while, while you're buying um, when, when you use it properly. So we can use blockchain technology to increase transparency and reduce risk. And frankly, instead of having to have these complicated, heavyweight, overbearing regulatory mechanisms, we can use technology to do those roles much more efficiently in a way that's then going to give the rest of us freedom of money, more reliable money. You put your money in the bank and you'll always get it back without having a concern about did that bank happen to put it into long-term T-bills uh, when interest rates are rising in unexpected uh, fashion. So we believe blockchain technology fundamentally changes the way we would build the financial system. It also connects us globally. Our job at Bitco, we think, is to make it so that everybody can ubiquitously access digital assets. That means businesses can access it. There's a lot of other companies that focus more on the retail side, but we want retail to be able to access it. And then once that's fully plumbed, we will see a better financial system. We only have about 20 seconds left, but what do you plan on using the funding money from in the latest round that you had? Look, we're building a business globally. So um, we have some growth outside of the US that's going on. Um, other parts of it are just you know growing, growing conservatively. We have been in the space for 10 years at this point. We've managed our money very well. Even though 100 million sounds like a lot, we've raised less money than almost anybody uh, else. And that's because we've got a pretty good business that runs fairly solid. Yeah. But we always want to have a balance sheet that our customers can count on. What's harder, building Chrome or doing this real quickly? Oh, absolutely. Digital assets are much harder. <laughs> um, I kind of feel like... I feel like I kind of knew yeah. the answer. Hey, Mike, be well. Have a great, <laughs> great weekend. Mike Belshi, uh, as you know, co-founder and CEO of BitGo. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business app, and YouTube. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. So as we said, a very, very timely story because a day when we were all uber focused on Fed Chair Jay Powell's speech this morning from Jackson Hole, we got the takeaway. We know, uh, you know, that they're ready to raise interest rates if needed until inflation is on that convincing path toward the Fed's 2% target. Um, and then we just talked with David Weston uh, just about the concerns that certainly the former U.S. Treasury Secretary Larry Summers has when it comes to those rising uh, deficits in government spending. But you know, add it all up, Jess, it's another component that as this Bloomberg big take, this most read story and this story in the new issue of Bloomberg Business Week gets to could put more pressure on higher rates, essentially. And especially looking at this, especially seeing investors see a high spending new normal, keeping interest rates and inflation elevated. So this is really going to be really crucial, especially ahead of that Fed decision on September 20th. All right, so let's get to it because uh, there's a trifecta or four, no, one, two, three, four people who wrote this story. Liz, <laughs> Campbell McCormick, Eric Wasson, Chris Condon, and Alex Tanzi. Liz, of course, as you know, Bloomberg News, Chief Correspondent for Global Macro Markets in studio with us, along with the editor of Bloomberg Business Week, Joel Weber. Talk about a timely story, Mr. Weber. <laughs> you know, it's almost like we almost like we planned it. Um, well done, well done. <laughs> so, so this was one that I, I was really interested in because it's that world where DC and uh, markets and the cost of money, everything kind of comes together. And what was surprising to me is how there is a bipartisan spirit in DC. 
Everybody likes to spend money, right, Liz? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I was on earlier talking on TV saying, listen, it's both sides of the aisle, so we're not talking politics because neither of them are doing anything to kind of work on the deficit. And uh, I was even saying in the Republican debate, there was a lot of focus on the debt and the deficit, but not like that party. And even uh, Nikki Haley said our side is raised debt too, you know, so it's it's a common problem. So yeah. what, what's different now, though, because how how much debt is too much debt, as we write, is a tale old as time, right? So so what's different now? Yeah, and that's something Ben Holland, one of our editors uh, on this, and him and I were talking about, and he's so smart, and that he was saying, and I totally agree, that what's different now is usually you have this wave of deficit spending when there's a recession, because we're trying to, of course, help everyone in the economy to you know get back on their feet or a big financial crisis and but what's happening now is this worsening deficit is happening even when we have growth right i mean you know i know there's been a lot of tightening but growth right. like you've guys talked is resilient so it seems like it's it's the juice that you know our policymakers want to always use and cbo's projections are that you know we're going to get to just about six percent of deficit of gdp and that's going to stay there for like 10 years you know so it's not like oh then we're going to get our house in order and i think that is what you know ben was saying and i agree that's the real change that because i remember in grad school in my class the twin deficits and i won't tell you how long ago that was so it's been around for a while it was it, just yesterday that's right damn it. Yeah. no but I, it does blow my mind that i think about how often every market conversation we used to have years ago um dealt with the the budget deficit and how much spending was going on and then it went away and so here we are so how much debt and you asked this early on or you know how much debt is too much right and i think honestly um no one knows the exact number there's been a lot of different theories but i think it's you know some of the pieces of what's going on now the fact that a lot of our revenue from taxes is going just to pay the interest on our debt and it's an increasing number some of the folks in the story were saying it's you know at like about 14 percent that's usually the number when you know the red flags go up and they're not you know so you know we we thought debt was a problem maybe a while ago now we've gone to 30 trillion right um yeah. so i don't think it's hard to know the exact number but the problem is it's not changing and um you know, again, this is our, you know, school theory, but it's true. And we have it in the story that it gets to be what you worry about crowding out is if the government has to keep borrowing, those rates are going up, people are plowing money into there, then for people, you know, companies, et cetera, borrowing, then they have to kind of pay up as well. So mm -hmm. it's kind of a ripple effect through the economy. And, and like you said, Carol, I think that's the key. And I, I feel like we tried really hard to to show it clearly in this story that this is a problem, but you're adding to that, that it's a backdrop of uber high rates from the Fed tightening so much, mm -hmm. inflation being sticky still, a lot of uncertainty, and then you add to that this fiscal backdrop, which isn't good, and Fitch, you know, of course, just one thing, but Fitch downgraded us, that's not good. Um, right. So it kind of all comes together as this amalgam of problems, right? You also wrote about how typically when we see this kind of move, especially over the past 10 months with the budget deficit, that's usually when the government is more in a recession fighting mode. But then how do you square it away with a lot of the strength that we've still seen in the economy? Exactly. That uh, recession, which I guess isn't going to eventually come, but it's not <laughs> now. And of course we had, and there were some arguments, the last package of the pandemic spending, right? You know, everyone didn't agree on that, but it went through. So the, all those trillions, but yeah, it hasn't like change we had this huge battle over the debt limit which came right. down to the wire now like eric wasson who's on the story so smartly put in about we have a battle coming up in september where we might have a government shutdown because they can't agree on what they yes. have to work out with this this deal so it, it's just not going away yeah even though the economy's chugging along pretty good it, usually like when i'm doing better making better money or whatever i try to pay <laughs> off some bills and stuff you know <laughs> <laughs> listening to liz mccormick math <laughs> <laughs> Government, are you listening? Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, so let's let's bring it back to the bond market because bond, bond market they they're cranky. They're always cranky, you know. They're and sky is always going to fall. But like, what are you looking what, for the vigilantes? What's exactly. Going on here? <laughs> we, we've written, we've written yeah. that before. like where where does this how, how does this end for for them and what are they specifically the most concerned about? Well, I think they're concerned that, like, I think um, who, the guest speaking to David Weston, or maybe he himself was saying that, I mean, we're already seeing the Treasury Department this quarter announced 
notes and bonds, so the long-term debt is rising for the first time in a couple years. Dealers are saying they're going to do that next quarter and the next quarter and who knows after that. So the investors are saying you have this barrage of debt coming um, from all along the coupon curve. We, all, we know that the foreign accounts have not been buying. They're more selling their treasuries. Yeah. So they're worried that what they call it like the wonky bond math, you need more of a term premium. You have to incentivize me to buy this long-term debt. And that's why we've had what the, some people call like a unicorn, this what they call a bearish steepener when the long rates are going up more, but all rates are going up. So it's like a bad thing. And that's what the bond market is kind of worried about more happening. It, it, but it's also bigger than that, right? Because as one of the sources says in the story, no asset class is really going to escape this entirely, potentially, it, right? That, yeah. That's the quote that, that yeah. was the money quote. Yeah, I thought that was a very smart woman in the story. Not that all the people aren't smart. Uh, we like Wait, to let's say that again. Smart woman. Smart woman. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, that she said, Liz, it's going to bleed into everything. You know, I know stocks have so far been really doing well. Yes, your world this yeah. year, but eventually, if rates keep going up, it's kind of when you have the debt rolling over. Like a lot of those, they call it the maturity wall. Right, it hasn't quite happened for corporations. They locked in rates for a while, but eventually, it's going to bleed into everything. Can I ask you something though? Is there smart fiscal spend, smart government spending that leads to? More productivity yes. and better growth? Yes, yes, exactly. And that's, uh, you know, many, of course we want to spend on things. To, my son's a civil engineer. We want to build roads and bridges and, you know, better trains and all that. That does help the economy grow. So, yeah, there is good spending. So that's why people are pointing out when more and more of the spending you would not call it so good just to be paying the interest on your debt. Right. That's not productive spending. Yeah. Remember when a fiscal hawk was a thing? Not anymore. <laughs> Not anymore. Just wait. Oxymoron. Yeah. 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 When it suits, when it suits. Listen, it's an incredible story. And it really is so timely considering all the conversations we had today. And yeah, government's keeping spending. Uh, it's just, you know, you can just add that to your worry list. Yeah, exactly. And higher rates. Higher rates. All yeah. right. Yeah. That's the story. I'm we not keep fixing saying. my deck. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not fixing my deck. Right. <laughs> Liz McCormick, we love you. Thank uh, you. Gem, as always, chief correspondent for Global Macro Markets in our interactive broker studio, along with the editor of Bloomberg Business Week, Joel Weber. Check out the new issue. This is in it on newsstands on the Bloomberg and at Bloomberg.com slash Business Week. Don't go anywhere. This is Bloomberg. I'm driving in my car. I'll turn on the radio. How about you let me drive? Oh, no, 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 no. Who's gonna drive you home? Honey, please, I'll do the driving. Drive on. Excuse me, I want to drive. You drive crazy. It's the question that drives us. This is the drive to the close. That funk to music will drive us till the dawn. On Bloomberg Radio. Still, still, still thinking about our star and all the stars. Oh, so many stars. <laughs> of Jay Powell and company. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, Carol Master, along with Jess Metten on this Friday. Jess, of course, in for Tim Stenovic. And we've just got under uh, about 17 and a half minutes left, getting ready to wrap up the Friday trade and the week overall. We've got stocks just coming off, as you heard from Charlie, their best levels of the session. And Jess, we did see uh, definitely a spike in rates earlier on. Uh, we've moved off of it. But nonetheless, you get a two-year that's above five percent are right at it right and especially we've seen the move in the 10 year as well and a lot of my conversation go into how fast and the speed of that and what that can translate into moves in the broader stock market so i want to get straight to our next guest who better to chat with us about this than nancy tangler chief investment officer at laffer tangler investments it's always really great speaking with you nancy and i first want to start off because we did hear as you know from fed chair jerome powell earlier this morning what's sort of your takeaway from what he said and how do you think this could impact the stock market heading into what's typically the worst month of the year in September. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me, Jess, on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> uh, listen, I didn't hear anything new. I thought um, it was kind of yesterday's news. Um, and then there was this sort of hokey reference to navigating, um, this, you know, this with the stars and on a cloudy night. I mean, I, I think what we know is that the Fed is closer to being done um, or is done. And that real rates, if you go back and look historically, you know, we saw a spike in the in the five year uh, tip after the 
after his comments, we got to like 2.26 or something like that. But if you go back and look in the 90s, real rates kind of vacillated between two to four and a half percent. And yet we still had an environment where stocks did extraordinarily well. So I, I think that hopefully the Fed is fading into the background uh, as we focus on fundamentals. And that's really the question. You know, is, for example, the, the GDP now uh, Atlanta Fed number of almost 6% GDP growth for the third quarter. Is that real? Is that correct? Do you think and it's real, that- Nancy? I'm so glad you went there. And I and our Mike McKee has said these aren't reliable numbers or, or you know, they move around a lot. But uh, a lot of people keep pointing to it and saying, look, look what's happening. Yeah. Well, I don't think so, Carol. I don't think it's sustainable uh, nonetheless. I mean, I, I think... We know from earnings this last quarter that companies did a much better job than Wall Street expected in not only delivering um, earnings and revenue beats, but expanding margins. And so I think that that is important to keep in mind. But we actually think you're going to see a little bit of a spike in, in inflation and probably the PPI. We got the Ulta numbers today and they, you know, their margins were lower than expected because of higher supply chain uh, costs. And so I think we're going to start to see the higher oil prices, higher prices of copper, uh, other commodities uh, trickle back through. And and we're working off of low base effects um, as we move forward. So I don't think it's it's an end to the decline in inflation. But I do think I don't think the market's prepared for it. Let's uh, let's just go there. I know and I- so I think we'll get some sort of a reaction. I know at Uh, various points this summer, you were overweight technology, but you did take some profits to some high-flying names like Broadcom, Palo Alto, Amazon. What are you buying? What are you selling? So we've been adding to some of the short cycle cyclicals. So a name like Carrier, for example, Um, but also just stick into our theme, Jess. I mean, our theme has been old economy companies that are embracing the digital revolution and then the suppliers of the arms and the picks and shovels. So like if you look at a company like PepsiCo, which we swapped out of Coke into Pepsi this summer, uh, this is a company that says it's a technology company that just happens to sell snacks and beverages. And now you've seen their involvement in the Instacart uh, deal. So that's something that we like very much. McDonald's, for example, had more downloads, four times as many downloads of their digital app than Starbucks did last year. And this and that allows the company to expand margins and, and increase growth. So those are the kinds of names that we're adding to and looking at. But we still like technology and on weakness, we will continue to add uh, to names like Oracle or Broadcom. Uh, and or NXPI. Uh, we like the semi space, of course, very much. Or NVIDIA. So waiting for my <laughs> chance, we um, <laughs> we missed it. It was a buy uh, for in our valuation work not so very long ago. But yeah, of course, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to own a big growth driver. It, this this is analogous to Amazon early days. So do you think it's kind of crazy? Like all of a sudden, is it Mike Wilson or, and among others? Yes. It's like, oh, look what happened to NVIDIA. Right. Oh, you know, the rally's <laughs> over, you know, like kind of throwing in the towel. Is that a little bit of an overreaction? Because look at how far NVIDIA has come this year. Oh, yeah. Listen, the bears rarely get to be in charge. And so once they get on stage, it's, they're mm-hmm. loath to get off. Um, it is not a, a flash in the pan. Uh, AI is not a bubble. And, and there's a lot of ways to play it, NVIDIA being the premier way, of course. But you can own a name like Microsoft. You can own a name like Broadcom and or Oracle. These are names that are playing around the edges but are critical and important uh, players in the AI space. And eventually there will be other names that will come you know, to the four IPOs. But right now we want to own the largest cap, most secure and reliable names in the space, and also enjoy the convergence between cloud computing, AI, and digitization. The, the secular tailwind behind this uh, phenomenon or fourth industrial revolution is is big and long lasting, and so you use uh, dips to add to your holdings. What's the top question that you hear from your clients? I mean, I think people are still scared that um, I had a client call me and say, we're in a new, uh, we're in a bear market. And I was like, no, actually, we're in a bull market. Huh. But but they're <laughs> they're really focused on volatility and the headlines. And, and so, so still you know, we spend a lot. I, I think so. I mean, we, we spend a lot of time educating our clients, staying in front of them during periods of negative envi- um, stock 
performance, but this is just a correction uh, in our view. And so we, again, as I said, are using it to round out our holdings. I'll just say one more thing. Going into 2020, we couldn't find any cheap, high quality companies. And so we put a hedge on our clients' portfolios. Because of the lack of breadth in this rally, we're still finding really attractive names at attractive valuations. And so that, that to me tells us this thing has legs. Well, fascinating. And listen, Nancy, don't tell anybody, but we save our favorite market guests for Friday because we get to yes. talk about the week overall. So <laughs> thank you so much. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. Nancy Tangler. All right. All right. <laughs> we really appreciate it. Have a wonderful weekend. She's Chief Investment Officer at Laver Tangler Investments, author of The Women's Guide to Investing, joining us from Nevada. That book, by the way, already on Amazon's best-selling pre-order list. It will come out on September 29th, um, but we're going to have her come back too, and we'll talk a little bit more about it, especially when it is. Uh, officially released but yeah I think that's kind of interesting because women sometimes get pushed to the wayside yes like it's like guys like all right what are you doing for your family and right it's important to think about um, women and that's something she's really to passionate to about too that she really cares about uh, in her spectrum so I've known Nancy a long time it's always really great getting all of her insight in all things markets yeah great perspective <laughs> too right because she's seen a lot of cycles and she understands a euphoria and when to be a little bit nervous or when Maybe it's on the money. Speaking of on the money, folks, we've got a rally underway on Wall Street and on track to see some gains overall for the week in some of those major equity averages. I think all of them, in fact. Stick around. This is Bloomberg. This is the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, TuneIn, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.